Good morning, folks. Good morning. If I can get you to stand with me this morning. And before we begin, I want to read a scripture. And it's found in Psalms chapter 40. And it's a Psalm of David. I waited patiently for the Lord. He inclined to me and heard my cry. He drew me up from the pit of destruction, out of the miry bog, and set my feet upon a rock, making my steps secure. He put a new song in my mouth, a song of praise to our God. Many will see and fear and put their trust in the Lord. Blessed is the man who makes the Lord his trust, who does not turn to the proud, to those who go astray after a lie. You have multiplied, O Lord my God, your wondrous deeds and your thoughts toward us. None can compare with you. I will proclaim and tell of them, yet they are more than can be told. In sacrifice and offering you have not delighted, but you have given me an open ear. Burnt offering and sin offering you have not required. And then I said, Behold, I have come. In the scroll of the book, it is written of me, I delight to do your will, O my God. Your law is in my heart. And it goes on in the next few verses to say what David would like to have written of him in the scroll. And it's a, you find in those words, they're not, there's not language of, the, the, uh, of, uh, of uh, it's, it's a language of delight desire, not language of duty, mm. in those words. God is good this morning. Mm-hmm. Amen. And faithful. And it goes on to talk about his steadfast faithfulness. If you take a few minutes in the afternoon to finish chapter 40, you'll see David's heart there. My heart was distressed neath Jehovah's dread frown. Below in the pit where my sins dragged me down. song 
Oh 
greatly to be praised. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. I need you more, more than, than yesterday. yesterday. I need you more. Taking our Bibles and turning to Luke 
chapter 19. He entered Jericho, he being Jesus. So Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. Behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was rich. He was seeking to see who Jesus was, but on account of the crowd, he could not because he was small in stature. So he ran on ahead and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him. He was about to pass that way. And when Jesus came to that place... He looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for I must stay at your house today. So he hurried and came down and received him joyfully. And when they saw it, they all grumbled. He has gone in to be the guest of a man who is a sinner. And Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor. And if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I restore it fourfold. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, since he also is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. This is the very word of God, church. What an amazing treasure. And Lord, we pray that you would open our hearts, our understanding today, that we would eagerly receive your word We pray, Lord, that we would yield ourselves to be changed by your Spirit, by your command. And we long for Jesus to be lifted high, to be glorified in every respect of of the speaking, of our hearing and receiving. In Jesus' name, amen. You can go ahead and be seated if you like. The reason that he came. I want us to be aware that Scripture is not given to us just in little bits and pieces. To be reminded that Scripture is, con- is in context. So as we look at a passage, that we would be uh, aware that it, it fits into a larger aspect of context. Some other things may be going on around it, before it, after it, in the midst of it. Going back all the way to Luke chapter 9, we discover that Jesus, he had set his face toward Jerusalem. It means that he, he knows his purpose for coming. And The purpose is the cross. So he sets his sights on Jerusalem. It doesn't mean just the destination of the city, but it means ultimately, because he'll be in Jerusalem at least once between uh, Luke 9 and where he is right now. But that it means that his eyes are set on the sacrifice, that he is going to offer himself up for the entire world. We read here that he is coming into Jerusalem, or excuse me, into Jericho. Now we need to understand that a bit of geography that's going on here. Jericho is the city at the is the lowest city on the face of the planet because it's just next to the Dead Sea. It's just north of the Dead Sea. Dead Sea is the lowest place on the planet. It's important for us to keep that in mind with a bit of the picture that's taking place here with Zacchaeus and yet another two individuals that are named just before him. If you notice in chapter 18, the last thing that we are left with before being introduced to Zacchaeus is a man who Luke doesn't name, but Mark does, and his name was Bartimaeus. Matthew tells us that there were two men that were blind. Matthew doesn't name either. 
Mark and Luke both highlight one of them, and probably because uh, the possibility that he was involved in the church at a later date. And so he would have been known to, to many of them. And so Mark names him specifically. So we see these few individuals here in Jericho, the lowest city on the face of the earth. And Jesus is coming to this place, and He's going to lift them up. He's going to take them from the lowest place, in a sense, and lift them to the highest. In the same context of what is taking place here, if you'll notice just before being introduced to uh, this blind man, Jesus, for the third time, is going to tell His disciples this, and I'd like for us to read it in verse 31. And taking the twelve, He said to them, See, we are going up to Jerusalem, and everything that is written about the Son of Man by the prophets will be accomplished. Praise God for that. Church, we we need to uh, be arrested by the uh, amaze, uh, the truth of the Word of God and how amazing it is. That it, it's not just a bunch of words strung together or men's ideas, but this is the very Word of God. So that Jesus is saying, we're going up to Jerusalem and everything that is written about the Son of Man, He's speaking about Himself, by the prophets will be accomplished. That means that what we have in the Hebrew Scriptures, what we refer to as the Old Testament, that those things that regarded His first coming were fulfilled in its entirety. And the climax of it all was what would take place in Jerusalem in just about eight, week, eight days or so from this point in time. For he will be delivered over to the Gentiles and will be mocked and shamefully treated and spit upon. And after flogging him, they will kill him. And on the third day, he will rise. See, this is what the prophets spoke about and what Jesus is saying that he's come to fulfill. And so even by virtue of this, Jesus is prophesying as well. And it would come to pass even as Jesus has spoken. But... They understood none of these things. This saying was hidden from them, and they did not grasp what was said. Matthew and Mark specifically will tell us that um, even his disciples, they're, they're not hearing and understanding the idea that Jesus is going to be handed over and was going to be killed, and that he's going to be raised again on the third day. They're not taking all of that in, even though this is not the first time that Jesus has spoken this very thing. James and John have a desire that they would, uh, when he comes into his kingdom, because this is kingdom talk, they're thinking, he's coming to Jerusalem, we're, we're being, uh, he's leading us there now, they're, they're heading there for Passover. And as they're making their way. Jer Jericho was the portal, if you will, the entry point, the, the last city that you would be in if you're coming down from the Jordan River, the Jordan Valley, and then making your way up to Jerusalem. You would come to Jericho, and then you would make your way up a, a fairly uh, rigorous as ascent called the Jericho Road. And the destination then at the end of that road is, of course, Jerusalem. Well, here Jesus, he's coming, and in, this, in the context of what's taking place, the, the people that are following him along with his 12 disciples and the rest that are, are making their way with this rabbi, he has spoken the fact that the reason he's come is so that he would be handed over into the hands of sinful men. He's going, to be, he's going to be flogged, he's going to be killed, and on the third day, he's going to be resurrected. And in the midst of James and John wanting to have this place of prominence, would, would you grant to us that 
we could sit, when you come into your kingdom, that one would sit on your right and the other on your left. And Jesus said, that's not for me to, to grant. It's already been appointed. It's already been determined. Then he makes this statement. It's in Matthew chapter 20. Where we read that Jesus says, the Son of Man did not come to be served, or to serve, excuse me, the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give himself as a ransom for many. For reference, would you turn with me there just so that you could see it in Matthew chapter 20? And that's in verse. 28. And it's right on the heels of that that we're introduced to the two blind men in Matthew's account. Mark chapter 10, similarly. I want us to notice that there are a, a number of people that we're being uh, made aware of in all that's being recorded here. Our focus presently, though, is on Zacchaeus. Jesus is coming into Jericho, and he was passing through. Now, keep in mind that everything that Jesus did, the timing was exact. He, he didn't get up uh, just whenever he happened to open his eyes and, okay, uh, well, maybe I'll sleep here just a, a bit longer and, and see what the day might bring. No, it was very intentional, very specific, very determined. He got up early in the morning, as was his custom, and he spent time alone in prayer. And then he would go about the, the ministry part of his day. So that when he's coming into Jericho, it's at a specific time and with a very specific purpose. Notice there's only one person who is named in Jericho. And for you and me, if we were fully aware of what was going on, we would say, well, why would the Scriptures take time? Why would the Holy Spirit take time to name this man, Zacchaeus? Because he would be severely looked down upon. He would be severely despised because he's a tax collector. But not only is he a tax collector, he's what kind of a tax collector? He's a chief tax collector. And remember, he's a Jew. And for the Jews, they despise the fact that Rome was, they, they had enslaved them to a certain degree, I guess you could say. They're not in chains, but they don't have freedom to, or autonomy to rule as they would see fit. And that's why they're longing for a Messiah, the one who would come to be king. And what these tax collectors would do is that they would bid on certain places, jurisdictions, so that they could have one of these jurisdictions. They would collect taxes for Rome, and then they would up the percentages for themselves. So that they could, whatever, whatever they had agreed to Rome, that's what they will pay them. But they were free to collect whatever they wanted to do. And they had, they had enforcers to help carry out the job. They had some Roman soldiers that would do the, the dirty business for them if they needed to rough some people up and give them a bit of encouragement to loosen their purse strings. So not only was it a tax collector despised because nobody in that day liked paying taxes. Anybody today like paying taxes? It's, it's hard to pay taxes when you see those monies being squandered in various ways. And for the Jews, the Romans were using those monies as oppression against them. But not only was he a tax collector, he was a chief tax collector. It means that he was a ruler over other tax collectors. So this man was highly despised, even to the point that the Jews had a category for them. He called them tax collectors and lumped them together with sinners. So the sinners of, of, of all kinds of, of the worst kinds were lumped together, sinners, and then you had a special kind of, of the low or the, the scum, and those were the tax collectors. 
tax collectors and sinners. So he was a chief tax collector. And he wanted to see who Jesus was. He was a short man. It's interesting, short man, and he had a, a lot of power, a lot of influence. So in, in society, his stature was fairly large as far as his control was concerned, but for the person himself, he was a short man. So when he learns that Jesus is coming through town, he kind of determines the path that appears Jesus is taking. So because he can't see over the heads and he can't press his way through the crowd to get to the front, then he goes ahead of the crowd to the anticipated uh, pathway that Jesus would be taking and he climbs a sycamore fig tree. He wants to see Jesus. But this is more than, uh, than Zacchaeus wanting to see Jesus. It's more than just a, a curiosity thing. The Spirit of God is including this account not simply because there was this no, uh, notorious man who was short and wanted to see Jesus. It's, it didn't give this story just so that we could have a song for Sunday school. Anybody remember singing that song? Zacchaeus was a wee little man. So he runs on ahead, he climbs up this tree, but it's not any kind of a tree, it's a sycamore fig tree. And when we see something about figs in the scripture, the very first occurrence of figs, where do we see it? It's in Genesis chapter 3. After Adam and Eve sinned and their eyes were opened and they had seen that they were naked and all of a sudden they realized they're not covered by the glory of God any longer. They're not clothed by, the, by the, the brilliance of the glory of God. So what do they do? First of all, in recognizing this, they are filled with shame and they attempt to do something to cover their shame. So they sew together fig leaves as coverings, as clothing. It's man's attempt to uh, present themselves before God. Figs, fig tree, fig leaves really represent man's works. So here's Zacchaeus doing whatever he can to see Jesus. But what I love about this is that it's not just, I hope I got it right, I hope I got the path right, I hope I figured out which direction Jesus will be taking, what seems most likely, because it wasn't a matter of him nailing it or, or projecting it correctly. Because Jesus was on a mission. What do we read at the very last here in verse 10? Where Jesus speaks about what has taken place with Zacchaeus in, in the encounter that we read about that is recorded for us here. He says, the Son of Man came to seek and to save what was lost. Doesn't this sound familiar to what Jesus had spoken in reference to the outcry of the religious leaders back in Luke chapter 15 that they were complaining, they were grumbling and saying that who is this guy that he eats with? Sinners and tax collectors. It's the very same thing that we see here, that Jesus purposely comes through that route in Jericho to seek out Zacchaeus, the lowest of the low. Do you remember what Jesus said about the rich young ruler when the the young man said, what must I do to have eternal life? And Jesus said, well, uh, keep the commandments. And he said, which one? So he, he names off. Uh, a handful of them and he says well I've done these since I was just a a little little kid what am I lacking and Jesus said to him to do what go and sell all that you have and give it to the poor you see that in the very middle of chapter 18 it's the same context of this group of people that we're seeing that are they're not circumstantial. It's not coincidence that they're listed in the same proximity together. 
this young man, he, he goes away sad because he was very rich. He was wealthy. He didn't want to give up what he had. See, he loved what he had more than he, he loved God. That's what was keeping him from the kingdom. See, he said, I've kept the commandments, but the one that he's missing, the most important, if, if we can look at it that way, is the first commandment is that you shall have no other gods before me. And then what did Jesus say in reference to those who are rich and the kingdom of heaven? Ha have a look here in verse 24 of chapter 18. Jesus, seeing that he had become sad, said, how difficult it is for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. For it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. Zacchaeus, probably one of the wealthiest men in Judah. He's very wealthy, very well-to-do. And for the religious leaders, here's what they would say. Riches were a sign of God's blessing. Wealth was an indication that God had blessed an individual. But it wasn't always the case. Because there were those whom God had, had blessed, and those who were very righteous, but they were very poor. Then you get some like Zacchaeus, who they considered to be a traitor, and by all intents and purposes, he's, he's turned his back on all that that perhaps he was raised with, most likely he was raised with, because he was now prevented from attending synagogue. He couldn't go into the court of men at the temple to worship God. So he decided it was more important, more desirable for him to forsake that, to, to sacrifice those things so that he could get wealth, so he could get influence, so that he could be rich. And Jesus says how difficult it is for a wealthy man, a rich man, to enter the kingdom of God. But Peter ended up saying, well, who then, who then can be saved? And Jesus said, what is impossible with man is possible with God. See, church, it's not just rich men, those who have a lot of material wealth, that it's difficult for them to enter the kingdom of heaven. It's anyone who considers themselves rich enough without God, no matter what they possess, no matter how much or how little, if they say that they're, I'm, I'm okay, I'm, I'm well enough off without God, it's, it's difficult for them to enter into the kingdom of heaven because they don't see their bankruptcy. They don't see their poverty. You could have somebody who doesn't even have two pennies to rub together. Well, in, in our currency today, two nickels to rub together. Yet they would say, I, I, I'm still, I'm, no, I, I don't want to give up and give in to God. And here we have a man despised by all of his, his countrymen, by all of his relatives, And Jesus, when he came to the place where Zacchaeus was, he, he didn't keep going, did he? It's a familiar story to us. It's a familiar account, but let's not allow our familiarity with the context or the, the outcome of the story or the flow of the story cause us to miss what's going on here. Jesus came through Jericho that day for, with what purpose in mind? Was it a surprise when he saw this man up in the tree? He knew who this man was and he was coming on this route. Knowing full well that Zacchaeus would climb that tree, which was a representation of, of man's works to try to get closer or higher to God. But Jesus doesn't respond to him on the basis or the merit of what Zacchaeus has done. He's calling out Zacchaeus and he tells him to do what? Come down. Come down from there. Even as in Genesis chapter 3 when the Lord comes in the cool of the day to seek for Adam and Eve. God was coming to seek them out. 
Where are you? He's not asking the question because he didn't know where they were. He's asking the question so that they would recognize that he's aware and so that they would acknowledge, they would confess where they are and why they're in hiding. God is seeking them out. He knows that they have made fig leaf clothing for themselves, designer Levi's, but with fig leaves. And what does the Lord do for them? He removes those fig leaves. He takes an animal, a lamb. He sacrifices that innocent animal, the blood being shed, the blood of the innocent in the place of the guilty. And what did he do with the, the coat, the skins of that, the skin of that animal? Took it and made coverings for Adam and Eve. Church, the very picture, a foreshadowing of what Jesus would do and what he was coming to accomplish for us is to take us out of our fig trees, is to take those works of the flesh, our attempts to be approved and accepted by God. which failed at every, at every point, every corner. Because of all of our righteousness is as filthy rags. Uh, all of our righteousness, it doesn't measure up. We fall, fall short of the glory of God. Amen? Jesus has His eyes set where? At Calvary. His eyes are set on Jerusalem. He's making His way to Jerusalem. And as He's on His way, He tells His disciples, He tells His followers, I'm going to Jerusalem. And everything that is written about the Son of Man by the prophets is going to be accomplished. But it's not just that it's going to happen to Jesus as though He's a a passive recipient of whatever might be taking place. It's that He's going there as being the Lord at his death. Of all of the outcomes that are about to take place, he is directing it completely. So he's going to Jerusalem, but he's not so fixated on the sacrifice that he's about to offer that he bypasses those for whom he's come to save. He seeks them out along the way as he is is making his his way to the place of provision for salvation. He says, come down from there. For I must, not I'd like to stay at your house today, right? I what? I must come to your house today. Let me ask you this. If somebody came by your house this afternoon, knocked on the door and say, listen, I wonder if I can come in for a visit. Or maybe, uh, put it this way, we've got cell phones and so on, so probably somebody, more realistically, they're going to say, I- I'm, I'm in the neighborhood, I'm coming by in your, your area in about 10 or 15 minutes, is it all right if I pop in? And now we feel what? Obligated to say Yes. And then what happens as soon as you hang up the phone? A mad dash takes place to make sure everything is in place. Is, is the bathroom clean? Uh, is the bed made? Is, is the floor swept? Do I have any food to put before my company? Some may be easier at flowing with that sort of thing than others. In Jesus' day, he's not saying... Zacchaeus, I'd like to come visit sometime. He said, I'm coming, coming to your house today. See, what he's saying by wanting to come to his house is showing him that, that he's come for Zacchaeus. Look what happens when he hurries, came down, and, re, and received Jesus joyfully. And when they saw it, who are they? The people around, and quite likely the religious leaders. When they saw it, what did they do? They grumbled. They said he's gone to be the guest of a man who is a sinner. Jesus is saying the very same thing. He's doing the very thing that he gave the parable about back in Luke chapter 15, the three-part parable. It was a shepherd who had a flock of a hundred sheep. 
One of them is lost, and so what does he do? He leaves the 99. He doesn't just leave them unattended. He leaves them in, in another shepherd's care. And then he goes out, searches wherever he needs to, to seek out this lost sheep. And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders. And do, what does he do? He rejoices. He lays it on his shoulders. And re, he, doesn't, he doesn't kick it. He doesn't put it on a leash and drag it. Stupid sheep, why do you keep doing this to me? What does he do? He picks it up and lovingly puts the sheep on his shoulders. Rejoicing. When he comes home, he calls together his friends and his neighbors saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep that was lost. Or what about a woman having ten silver coins? If she loses one coin, what does she do? She lights a lamp, she sweeps and seeks diligently until she finds it. And when she has found it, she calls together her friends and neighbors and says, Rejoice with me, for the coin that was lost, I have found it. And then Jesus says, and this is what it's like in heaven. The joy that is, breaks out in, in heaven among the angels over one sinner who repents. Why do sinners repent? Do they just all of a sudden figure, oh, this would be a good idea. Why do sinners repent? It's because the Savior has come to seek them out and to save them. It's, it's the work of the Holy Spirit to draw these sinners to, to Himself. Romans 2 tells us that it's the goodness of God that leads us to repentance. What is the goodness of God? What's His kindness? Is it just that He, he treats us nicely? That's not what He's speaking about. The goodness of God is that He sent His Son. The one who deserved, the only one who deserved to be served, came saying, I did not come to be served, but to serve and to give my life as a ransom for many. And then, of course, there was a man who had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, I want my share of the inheritance, and we know the account. The father gave the share to the young son. He squandered it. He was off in a far country, finally comes to his senses and said, I'll go back home and I'll confess my sin, my wrong to my father, and hopefully, maybe he'll take me back in as one of his hired servants. But when the father sees him from a, a distance, a long way off, the father sees him, and what does the father do? He runs. And he, he takes his son in his arms, he covers him. This is the, the three-part parable that Jesus gives in response to the religious leaders who were grumbling, saying, this man receives sinners and eats with them. That's what his response was. And Jesus now shows just by virtue of, of who he is and the way he lives. He comes to Zacchaeus' house. He says, I must come to your house today. It, it was a... It, it was a, a a symbol, it was a, a demonstration that a friendship when you ate at somebody's table. So the people are grumbling. Jesus has gone to be the guest of a man who is a sinner and of the worst kind. But Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor. And if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I restore it fourfold. You know this comes from the law. Zacchaeus knew the law. It comes from Leviticus chapter 6. Will we turn there for a moment? I want you to see the wording of Zacchaeus 6, or excuse me, Leviticus 6 that Zacchaeus is, is drawing from.
Verse 2. If anyone sins and commits a breach of faith against whom? What does it say there? Against whom? The Lord. By deceiving his neighbor in a matter of deposit or security or through robbery or if he has oppressed his neighbor or has found something lost and lied about it. He swears falsely in any of all the things that people do and sin thereby. If he has sinned and has realized his guilt and will restore what he took by robbery or what he got by oppression or the deposit that was committed to him or the lost thing that he found or anything about which he has sworn falsely, he shall restore it in full and shall add a fifth to it. That means 20% to it. And give it to him to whom it belongs on the day that he realizes his guilt. And what does Zacchaeus he recognizes he, did, he hasn't done wrong to others. He has, he has done wrong to the Lord. It says, if anyone sins and commits a breach of faith against the Lord. Zacchaeus recognizes that he has sinned and committed a breach of faith against the Lord because of his actions, of what he had done to his fellow man. He's stolen from them and he says, I'm going to give half of my goods to the poor. Do you see the contrast that's going on here between the rich man? Sell all you have and give it to the poor. He went away sad. Here's Zacchaeus, without being prompted by the Lord, without the Lord saying, here's what you must do, this is a demonstration of a heart of repentance. Zacchaeus just gets up and, and he is responding to the goodness of of Jesus, the goodness of God who has sought him out today in spite of the fact that everyone else would have scorned him. And we see that very thing. They grumbled saying that he's going to eat at the house of a sinner. Nobody would have said a thing had Jesus sought out somebody else that was maybe the mayor of the city, even though he may not have been a God-fearer. People would have said, oh look, Jesus, he knows who to hang out with. But he responds, not only saying, I'm going to give half of my possessions to the poor, but if I've done wrong to anyone, I'm going to restore it to them, not adding 20% to it, but I'm going to increase it four times. That means 400%. And Jesus he makes a statement here. He says, Today salvation has come to this house, since he also is a son of Abraham. See, everybody else had written him off, and Jesus said, I don't write anyone off. I've come to seek and to save that which is lost, and he doesn't say, except for, and then fill in whatever blank that whosoever will believe upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Not if they work enough, not if they, not if they make enough restitution, it's whoever believes on the name of the Lord, what? Shall be saved. Church, do you see how, how amazing and how tremendous the, the gift of salvation is? That Jesus did not overlook anyone. And do you see what happens in this context that we look back at the very, um, just before the rich ruler in chapter 18, we see that Jesus said that let the little children come to me and don't hinder them for to such belongs the kingdom of God. And I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. It's speaking about this, this childlike faith. Nobody in society esteems children highly and say, look at how, how important they are. We even see that in our society today. The unborn. Isn't there a, a, an all-out war against the unborn? Not esteeming them. There's, there's a war against our, our young people where there's ignoring the sanctity of, of being created in the image of God, and, uh, acknowledging and accepting and encouraging gender dysphoria and all sorts of things and mutilation of bodies and minds. Society doesn't care about our young unless it serves their purposes and advances their cause. But Jesus came to seek and to save the lost from the youngest to the oldest. 
the richest to the poorest. See, the cross of Jesus Christ, His sacrifice, if it, if it doesn't work and apply for, for the person in the, in the gutter as, as much as it does for the person in the palace, then there's no use to it. You might say, well, Zacchaeus, he wasn't, he wasn't in a gutter. Well, in a sense, he was. He was in a moral gutter, wasn't he? Even though he was living high in life, and probably one of the nicest houses in Jericho. Do you see the picture that we have here? Is that this man who people would be looking at and say, he doesn't really see. He's seeing with eyes of faith. There's something about this man, about this Jesus, and he's willing to put his faith in him that he is God, that he is the Redeemer. And light and life has come to this man, even as we see in the picture of this blind man, of Bartimaeus. Everybody else, is, as Jesus is passing by, he, he's, he realizes there's a commotion. He hears the noise. He feels the vibration in the ground as many feet are, are coming near and then they're coming close. They hear the sound of a lot of excitement and revelry that's going on. What's going on? Jesus of Nazareth is passing by. And what does, what does this man do? He cries out, he shouts, Son of David, have mercy on me. And what did the people do? They said, be quiet. Don't bother the master. Leave him alone. The likes of you. He doesn't have time for the likes of you. The people, they said, when the people brought children, their children to Jesus, they said, leave him alone. He doesn't have time for the likes of the kids. He's not going to waste time on them. They're not important enough. He's not going to waste time on the likes of blind people because they're, they're like sponges on society. They can't work. They can't contribute. At least in their, many people's minds were concerned. They were like leeches. People had to lead them. Then they sat and then they, they would guilt you into giving. Would you give unto God by blessing me? And when they told him to be quiet, what did he do? He said, he screamed all the louder! Son of David, have mercy on me. And when Jesus came near, what did he say to him? To these two men, as Matthew tells us. What did he say to them? What do you want me to do? Did Jesus not know? No. Why is he asking the question? So they could have the opportunity to confess their need to him. He said, Lord, let me recover my sight. Because as much as the religious leader said wealth was a sign of blessing, which was erroneous, so they said blindness was a sign of God's curse or disfavor upon people. So people would write them off. Let me recover my sight. And Jesus said to him, recover your sight. Your faith has made you well. Immediately he recovered his sight and followed him, glorifying God. And all the people, when they saw it, they gave praise to God. Wow. Jesus came to do what? To seek and to save the lost. There's no one beyond. Church, when we think that, well, how, how is that person going to be reached? That person is so far gone in sin. How are they going to be reached? Church, Jesus came to seek and to save the lost. He'll penetrate through the darkness. If people want truth, if people are longing to see the light, when the light is shown to them, they will grasp onto it and say, Lord God, have mercy on me. Help me. Help me to see. He brings him to his feet. His eyes now are opened. And giving praise to God. Zacchaeus, similarly. See, there, this is taking place right in the vicinity of Jericho, right inside Jericho itself. And church, what do we see the first time we're introduced to Jericho? Who is rescued in Jericho? 
The only family that was rescued in Jericho was the family of a prostitute. The most unlikely of those to be rescued. Because most everyone else would say, not worth saving. Not worth seeking out. But Joshua, he said to the people of Israel, do this as the, as the Lord has shown us in the end of chapter 5 of Joshua. The Lord appeared to Joshua and he gave him the battle plan. And we see in Joshua 6, march around the city once a day for six days and on the seventh day. March around it seven times. And on the seventh time, when you hear the blast of the shofar, shout for the Lord has given the city. Would you turn for a moment? I want us to read Joshua chapter 6. Upon the command that Joshua had given in verse 22. But to the two men who had spied out the land back in chapter 2, Joshua said, Go into the prostitute's house and bring out from there the woman and all who belonged to her as you swore to her. So the young men who had been spies went in and brought out Rahab and her father and mother and brothers and all who belonged to her, and they brought out all her relatives and put them outside the camp of Israel. Verse 25, But Rahab the prostitute and her father's household and all who belonged to her, Joshua, saved alive. And she has lived in Israel to this day because she hid the messengers whom Joshua sent to spy out Jericho. Why did she hide the messengers? Because she had heard the, the message, she had heard the news and the fame of the God of Israel. But she wasn't looking to keep it on the outside and says, all the country, all the nation, all Jericho, the city, is shut up tightly because of you, because they're afraid. But remember me. But remember me. Because I know that God, your God, is going to put us in your hands. Take this scarlet rope, tie it in the window. And when we come, this will be a sign and a marker that this place is to be salvaged. Remember, who's, who are the ones that caused the city wall to, be, to crumble? God did. It wasn't the people. They weren't setting off charges and detonating uh, TNT and so on. God caused the walls to fall flat and every portion of the wall that encircled the city fell flat outward except for the portion of the wall in which was built the house of Rahab. And even to the point, because of this woman's confession, of her belief in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, that she became an ancestor of the one whom we're reading today. Because she married a man of Israel named Solomon. And they had a son, his name was Boaz. Boaz took a wife from Moab, her name was Ruth. And they were the grandparents of David, the great shepherd king of Israel. And of course, Jesus, we see in the genealogy of Matthew, chapter 1. See, she was grafted in to the family of God. But most people would have written her off. Why did Jesus come? To seek and to save the lost. Church, it's something that we celebrate all the time. It's, it's a truth that should never grow old for us. But especially so as we are, are coming just two weeks away from Resurrection Day of Passover. That Jesus came, His face was set on Jericho, He was, he was going to, excuse me, set on Jerusalem, and He was passing through Jericho on His way, and He encounters these various people as He's making His way to Jerusalem. And in Jerusalem... He lays down his life as a sacrifice, as a ransom for many. There are 
There's so many that we can tend to overlook and bypass. That are hurting, longing for, for Jesus to say, come down from that tree. Come down, let go of your works. Let go of your attempts to get higher to see me. You don't need to get higher to see me. You need to get lower to see me. Church, the way we see Jesus is not by getting higher, but it's by getting lower. It's by humbling ourselves and seeing that he gets higher in our vision, in our sight, in our estimation, in our realization. The Holy Spirit will magnify him. And we, the body of Christ, are the hands and feet of Jesus. We are his mouth. To go to the Zacchaeuses and the Bartimaeuses and the Rahabs and the, the children and the elderly, those that society has written off and have, have ignored and say they're not worth it. Church, even to the point that there's legislation being considered and some already passed to say, Listen, life is not worth living and we're going to make means and make it a, a possibility for you to end your life with the assistance of, of practitioners. Those who should be saving lives are now being engaged to end them. And church, we serve the risen Christ who has come not to end lives, but to give life. He came to seek and to save the lost. So let's say today... Lord, you've done amazing things for me. If we are in Christ, has he done amazing things? Like he has done marvelous things for us. Our blessings are beyond anything that we can speak of, that we can enumerate. There are just so many. Jesus said, as the Father has sent me, now I am sending you. So with the, the grace that we have received, that we would not allow it to be lost on us, that we would not hoard it to ourselves because the grace of God has been given to us to be an overflow, an outflow of His goodness to others. So can we stand today and give thanks to the Lord for our great salvation that He came to seek and save us, that He plucked us from the miry clay, but not just so that, that we could be now out of that pit and enjoy a better life and, a, and a, the confidence of heaven, but He's done so for the very purpose of now seeking out others to save them. We can't save them, but we can bring them to Jesus. Come down from there. Because I must, Jesus must eat at your house today. You must stay at your house today to change your life and set you free. So can we give thanks to the Lord for our salvation? And secondarily, can we ask the Lord to open our eyes to see the Zacchaeuses that some would say they're untouchable because they're too high in society. They're not going to care. The Bartimaeuses that are too low in society and they're not worth our time. Or the kids, what can they understand? Church, I was six years old when I put my trust in Jesus Christ. Our daughter was four. There's no one too young, and there's no one too old. There's great rejoicing. Over every person Who has a story, I once was lost, but now I'm found. I was dead, but now I'm alive. I was blind, but now I see. 
Lord, we thank you for the, for the light, the life, the freedom that you have given us. Would you give us eyes to see? Give us, give us willingness to open our mouths and to speak truth to people who are lost in their sin and still trying to climb the fig tree or to pick the fig leaves and make themselves presentable or acceptable for, with, with you. They would come to realize that none of those things are effective that you've come to set us free by your sacrifice. You've done all the work. Lord, would you give us ears to hear the cries of the Bartimaeuses? That we would encourage them. Yes, call out. Call out all the louder. He will hear you. He won't pass you by. We just lift our hands to the Lord and say, Lord God, I give myself to you to be used in whatever way. We would reach out to the lost.